This is the second movie on the reversal potential. Here, I'm going to explain to you what it is and how voltage clamping is used to evaluate the reversal potential and its value in millivolts. Now I'm going to show an acetylcholine receptor to illustrate what happens when acetylcholine binds to the receptor. The bottom line, and this is very important, is that the receptor is equally permeable to both sodium and potassium ions. Here we clamp the muscle fiber at some value, and next we will follow the flow of ions when the acetylcholine is puffed onto the receptors. Sodium ions are shown in red, and potassium ions are shown in blue. The acetylcholine molecules are shown as yellow. Next, we puff some acetylcholine on the synapse and open the acetylcholine receptors. The binding of the acetylcholine molecules onto the receptor opens the gate and allows both sodium and potassium ions to flow through the channel. A moment later, the acetylcholine diffuses off of the receptor and the channel closes. The question we ask next is what are the relative sodium and potassium currents that flow to generate the end plate potential, and how does that relate to the reversal potential? In fact, what exactly is the reversal potential? To illustrate these features, I'm going to first clamp the membrane potential to minus 75 millivolts, the potassium equilibrium potential and see which currents flow through the channel when the membrane is clamped at minus 75 millivolts. I then will change the holding potential and clamp the membrane potential prog to progressively more depolarized values, and we're going to follow the sodium-potassium currents that flow through the acetylcholine receptor at each value of membrane potential. When this is done, the whole concept of the reversal potential will become clear. Trust me. In this figure, the acetylcholine receptor is shown at the top. The acetylcholine is puffed on the synapse and it binds to the receptor and the receptor opens allowing sodium and potassium to flow through the receptor. At the bottom on the left, I plot the sodium currents shown in red and the potassium currents in blue that flow through the receptor when it was open there is a very large sodium current and no potassium current. The potassium current is zero. The sodium current is indicated by the long downward pointing red arrow next to the current record. The arrow points downward to indicate that sodium flowed into the muscle fiber while the length of the arrow indicates the amount of sodium current. The blue arrow pointing in both directions indicates that there was no potassium current at all. Next, I'm going to show you the flow of sodium and potassium currents in slow motion, showing first the sodium current and then the potassium current. Acetylcholine binds to the receptor, the channel opens, and there is a large influx of sodium. The large influx of sodium is due to the large driving force on sodium. Previously, the driving force had been defined as the difference between the membrane potential and the equilibrium potential of that ion. But I want you to think about the driving force in a simpler way. Just by considering the difference between the concentration force and the electrical force acting on the ion. In this case, there is a large concentration force driving sodium into the muscle, simply because sodium is much more concentrated on the outside than the inside of the muscle fiber. In addition, there is also a large electrical force attracting sodium into the cell, because sodium is, po is positively charged and the inside of the cell is clamped at a very negative potential, minus 75 millivolts in this case. In other words, both the concentration and electrical forces are acting in the same direction to drive sodium into the muscle, and thus the driving force on sodium is huge. Now let's look at potassium. 
there is no net influx or efflux of potassium ions at 75 millivolts because minus 75 millivolts is the potassium equilibrium potential. Stated differently, there is a large concentration force driving potassium from the inside to the outside of the muscle, but there is an equally large electrical force, minus 75 millivolts, attracting potassium back into the cell, or if you will, holding the positively charged potassium ions in the cell. Thus, for every potassium ion driven out of the cell by its concentration force, one potassium ion is attracted back into the cell by the electrical force, the negativity inside the cell. In other words, the driving force on potassium is zero, as indicated by the small blue line with two arrowheads that point horizontally. To reiterate, all of the current is carried by sodium, and all of the current flows into the cell, and that net current record is shown on the left where the downward deflection of the trace indicates that the positively charged sodium ions are flowing into the cell, and the amount by which it's deflected indicates the amount of current. Now let's clamp the membrane potential at minus 40 millivolts. But before considering the currents, I want to point something out to you so that you can think about the amounts of sodium and potassium currents in an easy way. Always remember, don't forget that the concentration force acting on sodium does not change at any of the membrane potentials. The only force that changes is the electrical force attracting sodium ions into the muscle fiber. The same is true of potassium ions. The concentration force does not change under any of the conditions. The only force that changes at different membrane potentials is the negativity holding potassium ions in the cell. So now let's follow the sodium and then the potassium currents that flow through the receptor when the receptor opens and the membrane potential is clamped at minus 40 millivolts. And the first point to be made is that while there is still a large influx of sodium ions into the cell, the amount of sodium influx at minus 40 millivolts is less than it was at minus 75 millivolts. The reason is that there is less of a driving force on sodium because the inside of the cell is less negative than it was at minus 75 millivolts. Since the concentration force driving sodium into the cell is the same as it was at minus 75 millivolts, that doesn't change. The electrical force, the negativity attracting sodium into the cell is now reduced which explains why there is a smaller influx of sodium ions at minus 40 millivolts than there was at minus 75 millivolts. The second point is that there is now a net efflux of potassium ions because there is now a driving force on potassium. Stated differently, there is still the same concentration force driving potassium out of the cell but now the electrical force holding potassium inside the cell is smaller than it was at minus 75 millivolts. Thus, there is now a net force driving potassium from the inside to the outside of the cell. The result is that the net flow of positive charges into the cell is greatly reduced, as shown by the plot of the net current on the far left. The reasons are that the influx of sodium is reduced because there is a smaller driving force on sodium, and the efflux of potassium is increased because the driving force on potassium has increased over the zero driving force at minus 75 millivolts. And the third point is the trend. As the membrane potential is clamped at more depolarized values, there is a progressively smaller influx of sodium and a progressively larger efflux of potassium. The reasons for this are that the driving force on sodium goes down while the driving force on potassium goes up as the membrane is progressively depolarized. And it follows from this 
that at a certain membrane potential, the inward flow of sodium and the outward flow of potassium must be equal. The membrane potential at which the two currents are equal is minus 10 millivolts. At minus 10 millivolts, the inward flow of positive ions carried by sodium is equal to the outward flow of positive ions carried by potassium, and thus there is no net current flowing through the receptor. That value of membrane potential is called the reversal potential. It is called the reversal potential because if the membrane is clamped at an even slightly more depolarized value, the current will reverse. That is, there will be a smaller influx of positive current carried by sodium than the efflux of positive charges carried by potassium, resulting in a net outward flow of current. This reversal from inward to outward current is illustrated by the current flows when the membrane potential is clamped at zero millivolts. The current has now reversed. The amount of potassium leaving the cell is larger than the amount of sodium entering the cell. There is now, therefore, a net efflux or loss of positive charges. All of these features are summarized on this slide. The first point, and the one you really have to keep in mind, is that the end plate potential is the change in membrane potential. And that change in membrane potential is caused by the currents that flow into the muscle. When acetylcholine binds to the receptors, there is at first a large net influx of positively charged ions carried by sodium because there is a very large driving force on sodium. The large influx of positively charged sodium ions causes the membrane potential to depolarize, resulting in the upstroke of the end plate potential. The depolarization does not eliminate the influx of sodium, but rather reduces it, while simultaneously increasing the efflux of potassium because the depolarized membrane increases the driving force on potassium. With the continued but progressively reduced influx of sodium, the membrane potential continues to depolarize until it reaches the reversal potential, where the influx of sodium is equal to the efflux of potassium. The membrane is then stabilized in that it cannot change. Stated differently, so long as the receptors are open, the membrane potential cannot depolarize further because for every additional influx of positively charged sodium, there is an efflux of positively charged potassium. The system is in effect clamped at the reversal potential. In the illustrations given previously, we were able to generate a reversed current only because we had an electrode inserted into the muscle that artificially injected positive current to clamp the membrane potential at zero millivolts. Without that artificial arrangement, the membrane potential could not have depolarized to zero millivolts because it was clamped at minus 10 millivolts, the reversal potential. Once the receptors close, the system then reverts back to the normal resting potential. The changes in the sodium and potassium currents that occur during the upstroke of the end plate potential are summarized on the right portion of the slide. This again illustrates that as the membrane potential depolarizes, inward sodium currents progressively decrease while outward potassium currents progressively increase until the reversal potential is reached where the two currents are equal. Of course, the cell never actually reaches the reversal potential because the membrane potential crosses firing threshold well before the reversal potential is reached. Indeed, that is the point of the excitatory synaptic potentials. They attempt to drive the membrane potential to a value well above threshold, thereby ensuring that an action potential will be evoked. The reversal potential can easily be calculated. Since the receptor is equally permeable to sodium and potassium, the reversal potential is simply the sum of the sodium 
and potassium equilibrium potentials divided by 2. That is the midpoint or difference between the two equilibrium potentials. In the case illustrated here, I use the standard sodium equilibrium potential, which is plus 55 millivolts, and the standard potassium equilibrium potential, which is minus 75 millivolts. The calculation of the reversal potential is then made by adding the two equilibrium potentials, which in this case is minus 20, and dividing by 2, which yields a reversal potential of minus 10 millivolts. The value of the reversal potential, however, is not exactly the same at every synapse. Its value depends on the intracellular and extracellular concentrations of sodium and potassium, where these concentrations can be slightly different at different synapses. In the chapter on the reversal potential, for example, the value given for the frog neuromuscular junction was not minus 10 millivolts, but rather was minus 17 millivolts. The reason for this value of minus 17 millivolts is that the sodium and potassium concentrations at the frog neuromuscular junction are actually a little different than I had presented in the previous portions of this movie. There, I had used the values for the sodium and potassium equilibrium potentials that occur in the squid giant axon and in the brain or at most other synapses. As shown here, the sodium equilibrium potential at the frog neuromuscular junction is actually only plus 50 millivolts, and the potassium equilibrium potential is minus 85 millivolts. The difference is minus 35 millivolts, and when you divide that by 2, you get a value for the reversal potential of minus 17 millivolts. Thus, the reversal potential at the frog neuromuscular junction is minus 17 millivolts, several millivolts lower than at most other synapses. But the mechanism by which the reversal potential is generated is the same, regardless of where the synapse is located.